Well, good morning, church. We are glad you are here this morning. If you are visiting with us, we are very glad that you are here this morning. You are our honored guest. Hey, I did want to mention just real quickly, uh, uh, Nick and Abby's boy, Bowen. Give him a high five if you see him today. His his all-star baseball team uh, won the whole series this year. Past weekend, so he knocked it out literally, and uh, that's great. I I sure do miss that. This August will be one year that Gilly's been gone, and I really miss uh, the, going to those games and coaching those games. And uh, I have been doing some stuff with uh, Destiny though, so I'm probably going to coach her, her U8 team again this year. So I'll just have to make her like Gil as best I can. So. Hey, uh, happy 4th of July uh, to you guys. It's hard to believe the 4th of July weekend is here. We're in July, so we're on the downhill side of this new year. Hopefully you have some uh, safe and fun plans to celebrate uh, this weekend. I, I did hear, though, a, a great little joke for the 4th of July. Do you know what the difference is between a duck and George Washington? And the answer is that a duck has a bill on his face, and George Washington has his face on a bill, right? So, so, so I thought that was a good one. But, but I did hear that, did you, and I didn't realize this until I read this. Do you realize that there are no knock-knock jokes about America? And do you know why that is? Because freedom rings. Uh, okay, I'm done with those. But uh, I... <laughs> I am, I am grateful for the 4th of July. You know, I, I saw a disturbing thing on the news recently where it talked about the percentage of people who were proud of America has went down considerably from what it was so many years ago. I, I don't buy it. I, I think we have this vocal minority, you know, uh, compared to the silent majority. And in spite of our, of our political divide that's going on in this world today, in spite of inflation, in spite of soaring gas prices, in spite of the craziness that we call this country, I still think this is the greatest country in our world. I really do. And I'm, and I'm glad that we're here. I, I pray God to bless this nation. I pray that we as God's people would bless this nation as we live as kingdom citizens for him. And you know, I didn't mean to say this. Pause just for a moment. Don't count this on my preaching time. But um, we're living in a time where there are some who will say within within Christendom, you know, that you, know, you got to be careful about saying how you like America and this and that because that's that's Christian nationalism and that's the, and, and I understand. I think their heart. I think I understand where they're coming from. But I do believe it is possible to love both God and our country right? I, obviously, God is first. Obviously, we are citizens of the kingdom, that we are on a mission here, but we've been blessed with this country, and I just, I, I pray for uh, this country daily, and, and I just pray that we as believers would make it a better place, and that's part of what the 4th of July is about, so I look forward to this 4th of July weekend, but I'm glad that you are here today. This morning, if you got your bulletin inside, you're going to find an outline. Now, this has some blanks. It has some scriptures, just a few things to help you follow along. As we are concluding a series of messages that I tag team preached with our elders, with our pastors, with your shepherds throughout these last couple months that we called One Thing. Now, this was inspired by a book of the same title written by a friend of mine who preaches for one of the largest churches within our fellowship, within the Restoration Movement Churches of Christ and Christian churches down in L.A. named Dudley Rutherford. If you didn't get a copy of this book, I still would recommend you get it. I think it's well worth the read. But over the last seven, eight weeks, we have looked at this these seven one thing passages that you find throughout the Bible. The video that I played before each message uh, throughout these last seven weeks. Kevin kicked it off by looking at one thing to seek from Psalm 27, verse 3. Uh, then we looked at one thing to prioritize from Mark chapter 10, verse 1. Bob talked to us about one thing to choose from Luke 10, verse 40 and 40, 41 and 42. Then we looked at one thing to believe from Galatians 3, 2. One thing to remember from 2 Peter 3, 8. One thing to know from John chapter 9. And today, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to look at one thing to do. When you start reading books like Philippians, which was written by Paul, in conjunction with some of his other books, like his letters to the church at Corinth, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, which we're currently studying right now, Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, it is very obvious that Paul was a sports fan. 
I mean, Paul, Paul's the kind of guy that when the World Series is on, he would have been watching it. During, during the, uh, you know, the, the Super Bowl, Paul, Paul would be watching the Super Bowl. Because he would often talk about uh, games and sports in analogies that he would use for the church and to encourage the believers at the church. Paul would talk about the Olympic Games that took place in Athens. And although Paul was a Jew, although Paul was even a Sadducee at one time, uh, Paul was also a Greek. He was born in his family owned land in, in uh, uh, Tarsus, where Paul grew up. So being someone who owned land in a Roman-occupied area, you automatically got Roman citizenship. So he knew about these games. When you read 1 Corinthians it's, uh, and 2 Corinthians, it's obvious that he knew about these games that were called the Isthmus Games. That's a, the, kind of like a smaller but g- really big event that took place in Corinth. Paul knew about these. Paul would talk about boxing and use that as an illustration for the Christian life. He would talk about wrestling and use that as an illustration for the Christian life. But one of the ones that he liked to talk to about a lot, and an example that you see in our reading today from Philippians chapter 3, Paul spoke of the Christian life as a race. So in your first blank, write that in, fill that in. The Christian life is compared to a race. And there are multiple passages I could share with you where Paul uses this analogy, this idea of running a race. Now, when it comes to sports, the majority of us tend to be spectators over participators, right? I mean, we, we like sports is one of those things that, you know, uh, football and basketball and soccer, they, they really help to increase muscles. And that's why in America, most of us, the strongest muscle we have is our eyeballs, right? Because that's what we do. We, we watch sports and we're really good at criticizing from our armchair, the way someone performs in a sport, right? Someone gets up to bat and they bat out, what a loser, you know, or someone can't pitch, you know, a good strike, ah, I can't can't pitch, we we always know what the quarterback should have done, we we know exactly how we would have fought that fight and we would have won that match, so we tend to be spectators, but when it comes to this this Christian life that we're called to live, that Paul says in many ways is like a race. Man, we are called to not be spectators. We're called to not just sit on the sidelines. We're definitely not called to just sit back and criticize. And some of us, we're really good at that. We're really good at letting people know how they're not running the race they ought to be running. Now, we ourselves aren't doing it, but I can tell you what you're doing wrong, right? We're a little bit too good at that. The Christian life is a race, and it's a race that we're called to run in. We're called to be more than spectators. We're called to do more than just be a fan of this Jesus thing. We're called to follow Jesus. Kyle Eidelman, a few years ago, wrote a book called Not a Fan, Becoming a Completely Committed Follower of Jesus. And in it, he makes this quote, The biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians, but aren't actually interested in following Jesus. See, Paul says one thing that he does in this life is this is a Christian race, and he presses on and he follows Christ. Now, in the next two blanks, fill this in. Following Jesus is a lifelong marathon. It is not a 100-yard sprint. This Christian life, this race that we are in, this following Jesus that is who and what we are, what Paul was pressing on to, the one thing that Paul says to do was to know and to be like Jesus. And he said, this is a lifelong endeavor. This is a marathon that doesn't end until we end, until God calls us home or he comes back to take us home. We are in this race from start to to finish. It is a lifelong race. It is not a sprint. It is not something that is short. The journey we are on following Jesus, loving God, loving one another, loving others, making disciples is a lifelong marathon. A marathon requires hard work. It requires perseverance. My bride has ran seven or eight marathons now. Is she more than that now? She's ran a lot of marathons over the last eight, nine years. And it is amazing the the time that she will put in and the energy she exerts. A marathon is, is it 26 point what? Is it point two? Yeah. I mean, can you imagine? I I, I don't want to run 26.2 seconds anymore. 
let alone 26.2 miles, right? And there are people that run even more than that in some of these things that we call ultra marathons. And just like that requires work and perseverance, following Jesus, this race that we're in, we're going to fall, we're going to fail, we're going to make mistakes, but we press on. When it becomes difficult, we press on to the finish. And then we can, like Paul, this next verse in Philippians chapter 2, Paul talking about this race, Paul talking about following Jesus, Paul talking about it being a lifelong endeavor in a marathon, he says, then... Then, after he presses on, after he's lived his life, then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. When can you boast? When can you relax? When can you say you're done? The day of Christ. The day that Jesus comes back or the day that he calls you to be with him. Him. So from our text this morning, just for a few minutes, what I want to share with you is three of Paul's racing strategies that he shares with us in this passage that Ron read for us. Three things that Paul says he does in Philippians 3 to run this race. And these are three things that I think are worthy of our imitating today as we're striving to run this race, to press on, and to follow Jesus. So fill in these blanks. Number one, racing strategy one, forget the past. Forget the past. We can't focus on, we can't worry about what is behind us. When the Apostle Paul spoke about this one thing that he does in this race, it begins with him saying that he strives to forget the past mistakes in his life. So in the New Century Version, it reads this way, Brothers and sisters, I know that I have not yet reached that goal. But there is one thing, say one thing. There is one thing I always do. Forgetting the past and straining towards what is ahead. Now, any of you who know anything about the Apostle Paul, if you've done any reading in the New Testament book of Acts, you know that Paul had a past, right? I mean, Paul had a very, very dark past, someone who persecuted and even executed the people of, in the book of Acts, before they were first called Christians, they were referred to as people of the way. And Paul made it his life ambition. Paul made it his goal. What he was focused on, what he was pressing to do, was to exterminate and to eliminate this heretic sect that was following this street preacher named Jesus. And he did all that he could. In fact, the Bible says that he was involved with, he may or may not have actually thrown a stone, but he was there with cloaks at his feet at the stoning of the first Christian martyr that we have recorded of Stephen. Paul had a past. Paul had, a, some, had something that could trip him up. Paul had something that could have hindered him. But he says, what I do is I strive to press on forgetting what is behind me and straining towards what God has ahead of me. Now, I know it is, you say, Chad, you can't forget your past. And, and you're right. I mean, it, it, is, it is practically impossible to completely forget mistakes we've made. In fact, if you're like me, I struggle trying to remember the good things I want to remember, and I feel like I can't forget the bad things I want to forget. Amen? Anybody else feel like that ever, right? That's rough. It really is. And so we, we're not saying that you totally, that you say, well, the past didn't happen, or I'm just going to completely forget about it, or it'll, it'll never pop up in, in my mind again. We're not called to be oblivious to our past. We can learn from our past. We should grow from our past mistakes. In fact, me personally, this might just be me, but me personally, I feel like I have learned more and grew more from mistakes I have made over victories that I have had, right? So we can grow from our past. We can learn from our past. We're not called to just forget as in, oh, it never happened, right? That, that, that's not what we're called to do. Someone pointed out to me once that the rear view mirror in your car or in your truck is smaller than your windshield. And you say, well, duh, right? Of course, the rear view mirror. But the rear view mirror is important, isn't it? It's important to occasionally glance. You don't stare at, you don't focus on, your, your complete attention isn't set on what is behind you, but it's good to occasionally look to see what was past. 
But the important part, the bigger thing that you ought to focus on is what's in front of you. And that's what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying as he presses on to do this one thing, to run this race that God has called him to run, he forgets what is behind, meaning he's not stuck in his past, meaning he doesn't allow his past to hinder him, meaning the mistakes that he made then is not going to stop him from being who God wants him to be now and who he's going to continue to grow and to be. Don't let your past mistakes weigh you down. Forget the past. And here's why, because if we are in Christ, the Bible says this, if anyone is in Christ. Anyone. That means you, right? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Did I read that right? What has the old done? It's passed away. It's gone. The new has come. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. See, the Bible says in Christ, there's no condemnation. The Bible says in Christ, we have complete forgiveness. God has forgiven us. God has forgotten our sins. The Bible said God chooses to not remember our sins. That's Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. I will not remember their sins. I will remember their sins rather, no more, he says. So if God can choose to not remember our sins, we can choose to not allow our sins to hinder us from being who and what God wants you to be today and until he calls you home when you finish this race. Forget the past. Don't let it trip you up. I think one of the ways this is best stated was by the great Chinese philosopher, Master Ugwe from Kung Fu Panda. He says, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. That's why we call it present. So that leads to number two. Number two in Paul's strategy is this. Fight in the present. Forget the past, Paul says, and fight in the present. Let's deal with what we have in front of us right now because yesterday is truly gone. And as much as all of us would love to be able to go back and change something about yesterday or something about yesterday's yesterday or anything in our past, we can't. There is nothing we can do to change what happened, but we have today. We have the blessing of now. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know if we're going to watch fireworks tomorrow or Jesus is going to come back tomorrow. I I know which one I would pick over the two, but we don't know for sure what's going to. So we fight in today. We press on today. We're in this race today. When the Jesus followers said, Lord, John had taught his apostles how to pray. Would you teach us how to pray? And and Matthew records that Jesus says, well, sure. When you pray, pray like this. Then he recites this thing that we today have called the Lord's Prayer. And when he says that, I memorized it in the King James. And since there was no praise team today, it felt appropriate to maybe quote some King James this morning, right? So in the King James, it says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our yearly bread. Well, that's not what King James says. Give us this day our monthly bread. Doesn't say that. Give us this day our weekly bread. Doesn't even say that. You know what it says. Give us this day what? Our daily bread. Fight today. Forget tomorrow, let's not worry about what's, or yesterday, let's not worry about tomorrow, let's fight today. So Paul says, Philippians 3, not that I have already obtained all this, or have already achieved my goal, but I press on. He presses on today. I press on to take a hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of for me. I love I love that in this passage, this is such a great text, and I know you've heard this text before, but it's so good to reread and be reminded about this, 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 this race that we're on. Paul says, I have by no means achieved this race. I have not been made perfect. I have not completed the goal. I mean, Paul is someone that, next to Jesus, probably one of the most influential people in the world, right? 
I mean, most of our New Testament is written by Paul. We're talking about someone who, when he, was, when he had this dramatic conversion, you can read about this in Acts 9, this dramatic conversion when he's on the road to Damascus and he sees the risen, resurrected Lord who lets him know that it is the Lord he's been persecuted. And then he, he is saved, he is changed, he is transformed, he is baptized into Christ. And because Jesus, because Jesus took a hold of him, he says, I now press on. I forget what's in the past, but today I am striving to take hold of that which Jesus took hold of for me. That Greek word that in our English version says take hold of, uh, in the Greek literally means to win, to acquire, to possess, or to make one's own. Paul is saying, I want to take a hold. I want to win. I want to acquire. I want to possess. I want to make own what Jesus took hold of for me. Jesus changed and transformed his life, and now I'm going to live my life following him, telling other people about him so that their lives can be changed and their lives can be transformed as well. Paul's goal was to run the race, to take a hold of that which Jesus took hold of for him, the call to follow him, to know him, to be like him, and to lead others to him. Fight for today. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul talking about these Isthmus games that took place in Corinth. He would say this, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training, Right? When you go into a strict training for something, it doesn't matter if yesterday you didn't get the laps in that you meant to get in. Maybe yesterday your diet wasn't what it needed. Today, today you go into this strict training. He says, therefore, Paul says, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer just hitting the air. I mean, Paul is saying that he is staying focused. I forget the past. I'm in a fight today, and I'm going to keep my focus. So that leads to number three then. The third blank, and two blanks, and the third strategy is this. You focus on the prize. Paul says he ran not aimlessly, but with a focus. That he boxed not like someone beat in the air, but with a focus. And his focus was on what here in Philippians chapter three, he calls the prize. Now, any accomplished athlete will tell you that goal setting is essential to achieving success. And this is true in any worthy endeavor, right? That goal setting is essential. And for us who believe, for we who follow Christ, there should be no other ambition more important than running this Christian race, than setting our focus on this prize that's been set before us. So again, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul says this, do you not know that in a race, uh, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. You know, in Paul's day, in those Ithmus games, the prize that they ran for was a wreath literally made out of greens, literally made out of twigs and branches. And you would get that, and even setting that up on your counter, it's not going to last very long, right? It's not like a trophy we get today. But if you continue to read that text, if you've been in our study on Wednesday nights, he says, we're running towards an eternal goal, an eternal prize. But he says, this is one thing he does, that, that I focus on this. Most, not all, but most, most athletes tend to focus on one thing, one sport. They tend to train sports specific for what it is that they do. And it is rare, it's not impossible, there are a few that come to mind, but it is rare to see an athlete that excels in multiple sports, right? I mean, you think of someone like Charles Barkley. When you think of Charles Barkley, what sport do you think of? Basketball. And he was an accomplished basketball. But if, don't do it now, but if you, later today, Google Charles Barkley golf swing. Uh-huh. It's, it's, he's not a golfer, <laughs> okay? He goes out and he does it, but that's just, that's not his thing. Um, you ask anybody my age and older, who is the greatest, who's the GOAT, greatest of all time basketball player? They're not going to say LeBron James. They're certainly not going to say Curry. You know who they're going to say? Michael Jordan, the GOAT of basketball. No one has done what he's done. I don't know if anybody ever will do what he did to the sport of basketball. But after he retired from basketball, he decided to try his hand in baseball for just a little bit. 
it was, let's say, less than lustrous, right? I mean, his name drew crowds, but his abilities in baseball were not his abilities in basketball because his focus for all those years was that one thing. Here's what I I need to train for this. And Paul was saying in this Christian life that we're in, we're called to focus on the prize. One thing to do in this race, press on and focus. So again, one more time, Philippians 3, 14, Paul says this, I press on toward the goal, circle the goal. I press on toward the goal to win the prize, to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now let me wrap this up with something I think is very important for you to know and to understand about this Christian race And something that's very important for you to know and understand about this prize. You know, what is this prize? Because it may shock you. It may surprise you to hear me tell you as your preacher that the prize is not heaven. Heaven's not the prize. Heaven is not the goal in this text. The Bible says that God sent his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Eternal life. Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus told Martha at the funeral of her brother Lazarus that, that, that someday she would see him again. She said, I know I'll see him again. He said, no, I am the life. I am the resurrection. If you are in Christ, you are getting to heaven because you're going to be where he is. Your goal is not heaven. That was Christ's goal for you when he died on the cross. The goal here, fill this in, the goal in this Christian race, it's not heaven. It's to know and to be like Jesus. That's your goal in this life. That's your goal in this race, not a sprint. In this lifelong marathon, we are called to know and to be like Jesus. We are called to have a relationship with him. We are called to be where he is. And guess what? If I know and I am like and I have a relationship with and I am striving to tell as many people as I can what it means to have a relationship with Jesus so that they might have a relationship with Jesus, when it comes to that time, you know where I'm going to be? I'm going to be where Jesus is. You know where Jesus is? He's in heaven. Heaven's not the goal. The goal is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So Paul says it this way. I didn't put this on your outline, but it's here on the screen. Philippians 3, part of what Ron already read to us. I want to know Christ. What does Paul want to do? I want to get to heaven. No, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his suffering. Becoming like him. You you might circle those. Know Christ, become like him. That is the ultimate goal for God for you in this life. To know Jesus and to become like him. And then, so why? And then somehow, become like him in his death. Then somehow, attaining the resurrection from the dead. The goal is, the goal is not heaven. The goal is to be like Jesus now. It, it's not just the sweet by and by. It, it, it's the here, right now, right? People talk about it, it's the pie in the sky. Yeah, but I want the steak on the plate too, right? I, I, I want to deal with what God has me in this life, right? Forgetting my past mistakes and, and fighting for today and pressing towards that goal. What's that goal? Every day, I want to be a little bit more like Jesus. Every day, I want to tell somebody else about Jesus. You've heard me say before, there are only two things I think that we're going to be able to do in heaven that we can, or that we can do here on earth that we will not be able to do in heaven. The first one is sin, because you're going to be perfect then, because Jesus has covered it. As Bob said, in his, he paid that price we couldn't pay. We'll be made perfect, complete, new bodies, resurrected bodies in heaven. The other thing you can't do in heaven is tell somebody about Jesus, because they already know him because they're there because of him too. So if the only two things that you can't do in heaven that you can do here is sin and tell people about Jesus, which one do you think you're left here to do? Sin? I'm not asking you which way do you live. I'm saying which one do you think is right? Sin or be like Jesus? Be like Jesus. Tell other people. That's the goal. That's the prize. Paul says we're in a race. One thing to do, press on. Finish this race. Achieve that goal, and that goal is becoming and being just like Jesus. I want to close with a true story, a true illustration. 
that I read from a guy named Ben Smith. Just recently wrote this, August of 2021, he posted this on his blog. And it was, the title of the blog was, Just Keep Running. And the only reason I found it was because I Googled earlier this week or last week, running illustrations. And this just happened to come up in my Google. So I read this article, and it's called, Just Keep Running. It's the story of Cliff Young. Now that's Cliff Young. Who here, anybody here know who Cliff Young is? Anybody? No. I I didn't know either before I read about this. But in the running world, for people who run marathons, and especially in the country of Australia, they know who Cliff Young is. I have a friend of mine named Peter Horn who uh, preaches in New York. He's from Australia. I said, Peter, you know who Cliff Young is? Absolutely I know who he is, right? Well, in Australia, they had this marathon that was called the Ultra Marathon. Now, this marathon began in Melbourne, or rather in Sydney, at this huge shopping mall in Sydney, and they ran from Sydney to Melbourne, Australia, where the finish line was, at another shopping mall. That distance is 870 kilometers. Now, tomorrow is 4th of July. We don't have to know kilometers because of the 4th of July. So, for the rest of us, that's 544.7 miles. Almost 545 miles. That's what this race is. The very first one ever was held in 1983. And in 1983, Cliff Young would have been 61 years old. He was a toothless potato farmer and sheep herder. And on the day of this ultra marathon, when the crowd was there, runners, elite runners from all over the world were there to run and compete in this. Here comes this 61-year-old toothless potato farming sheep herder wearing bib overhauls and knee-high gum boots. He goes up to the registration booth. He says, I want to run this race. Of course, the people organizing the race thought he was joking, thought somebody was just playing a prank on them, and they laughed at him. And he said, no, really, I want to run this race. So they gave him a number. He pinned his number on his bib overalls. With his rubber galoshes up to his knees, he got to the starting line, and he ran the race. Now, here's why Cliff Young was famous, especially in Australia and to marathon, especially ultra marathon runners today. Not only did he compete in the race, but he won the race. He came in first place with a time of five days, 14, 15 hours and four minutes. At 1.25 a.m., he crossed the finish line in this race. And he did, this was not a photo finish. This was not like marathon races you see today where you see like 25 cookie cutter looking Kenyans right there crossing at the exact same time and there's one guy that's got a nose that far across. No, he won and the guy that came in second place, the guy that came closest behind Cliff had come in at nine hours and 56 minutes later. Now, one of the things that people joke and laughed about when Cliff started the race was how far behind he was when the race began because he had this little shuffle. His gum boots, his bib overalls, he just, he would shuffle when he ran. And he finished the race. And people today, there are actually scientists and and, uh, distance runners who have studied that shuffle and have figured out that the energy efficient way that he ran actually translated into a good way to run if you're running an ultra marathon like this. Now, do you want to know how? Do you want to know how this 61-year-old toothless potato farming sheep herder was able to win this race was able to come in almost 10 hours ahead of the most elite athlete behind him on that race. You want to know how he did it? Come back next week and I'll tell you. No, I'm just teasing. I'm, <laughs> here's what he did. So these athletes that trained for this, what they would do, they, ran, they would run, they trained themselves for months and months for this race. They would run 18 hours and then sleep six hours. So that's how they did it. The 18 hours you run, 
And then you say, can you imagine running 18 hours? I can't run. I, I seriously don't know if I could sprint 18 seconds today. I really don't know if I could. But 18 hours and then rest for six hours, then get up, run 18 hours, rest for six hours. Well, nobody told Cliff about that. So Cliff ran this race in his bib overhauls with his knee-high gum boots, five days, 15 hours, and four minutes without stopping. He just did this little shuffle. That's all he did. He didn't stop. They said, well, what'd you, the reporters were going, what, what, what did you eat? What did you eat? You, you what he had, he had a backpack. You what he took with him? Pumpkin seeds and water. Five days, he just ate pumpkin seeds and water. They said, how were you able to do that? It turns out that Cliff, on the sheep ranch that he grew up on and that he ran at that time himself, he had over 2,000 acres and over 1,000 sheep. They were so poor that they couldn't afford a tractor. They didn't have any mechanical way to, to round up the sheep. So when the sheep need rounded up, you know what he would do? He would run and round up the sheep. And he'd been doing that for almost 50 years of his life. And he said there were times he'd run three, four days at a time, just gathering all these sheep up, trying to get them back home. So that's what he did. He just went and he just plugged away. The other runners would train. He didn't know. He just kept going. And Cliff, at 61, this toothless potato farming sheep herder, won the first ultra marathon from Sydney to Melbourne, five days, 15 hours, and four minutes. Here's why I share you this story, besides the fact that it's a pretty cool story. It, you don't have to have all the fancy gear. You don't have to have the perfect look. You don't have to have it all together. You know what you have to do? You press on. You, just, you, you shuffle. You say, yeah, but Chad, you don't know what I did in the past. No, you just press. Yeah, but uh, you don't know what I'm facing today. You, don't, you fight for today, you just press. Yeah, but I don't know what... I'm, no, your goal is to be more like Jesus and with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, working in you to change and transform you, God will make you more like Jesus each and every day that you do this one thing. You press on towards the goal for which Christ has called you heavenward. The Christian race. One thing to do, press on. Forget the past, fight for the present, focus on the prize. Run, fix your eyes on Jesus. Run, follow him. If you fall, get back up and run. So, get ready, get set, let's pray. Lord, I ask a blessing upon everyone here today. I pray as we conclude this series of these one things that you're calling. We know we can't do everything, but we can do one thing. And I just pray that these messages have impacted us in such a way that we would strive to do the one thing that you are calling us to do. Help us to see and to understand and to know what that one thing is. And Lord, we know that we are in a race. And no matter what's going on in our world, no matter mistakes we have made in the past, we are fighting for today. We want to be more like Jesus, so help us focus on that goal so that we might win that prize to know and be like him and to obtain resurrection from the dead through and only because of Jesus. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today that has not yet been baptized into Christ, that they might make that decision. Anyone here who is listening that needs you to intervene in a miraculous way in their life, that you would do that. But Lord, I pray you help us to do this one thing. Let us press on and take a hold of that goal for which Christ Jesus took a hold for us. We pray this in his name and amen.